So playing with the Universe is the title of this panel. Um, the panel where we talk about making it all up and then some. As if writers don't get to control enough, some of us go a step further and make up our entire worlds. First up we've got Bray Willows, no stranger to fantasy or fairies. Bray is a long-time editor and writer. Her passion is literature and the classics, and she's published a large handful of short stories. When she and her partner aren't running a social enterprise working with marginalised communities on writing projects, she's editing other people's writing or doing her own. She lives in England with her partner and fellow author, and spends entirely too much time exploring castles and ancient ruins while bemoaning the rain. Ray's going to read from Spinning Tales, a fairy tale about fairy tales. So this is uh, where my character has already moved into her new abode and is just learning about whatever is happening and is still confused, as we all are. She made breakfast and put down food for Black. When she looked around for him, she saw him sitting by the back door, staring at it. His fur was raised, and the door creaked open. A feeling of dread swept through her as she remembered the opening lines of the book, never leave the door unlocked. But the door had been locked. She checked it before she went to bed. Cautiously, she made her way over and picked up Black, who didn't look away from the door. After counting to three, she yanked it open to see her backyard, just a normal backyard in the early spring. Jesus, age, Black. What the hell is with this door? She set him down and he smelled at it, his fur still puffed up like he'd been rubbed with a balloon. He stuck his head out, looked around, then sauntered over to his food dish, apparently satisfied his territory was safe from intruders. She locked it and double-checked that it couldn't open on its own. Creepy. She took her cup of coffee over to the chair and reopened the book that came with the apartment. Once again, a piece of paper fell out. This time, it had an address across the town, and the words, Find the Shepherd, written below it. The coffee turned extra bitter, and Maggie set the cup down before she spilled it. This paper wasn't in the book yesterday. She had no doubt about that. Was that why the back door was open? Had someone come in and left her a message? Sure, because that's what people do. They come into your house on top of an apartment building and leave you weird little notes instead of stealing your stuff. <laughs> she closed her eyes and tried to calm her nerves. She could take on bullies on the street with a baseball bat, but having creepy things in her new home was a different ballgame. She opened her eyes when she felt Black's paw on her hand. He pushed the paper at her. No. No way can you weird me out too. You've been a normal, if slightly overly grouchy, stray. You can't get all spooky too. He yawned and pushed the paper at her again. Fine. She stood and stomped upstairs to the bedroom. Fine. I'll listen to a book and a cat. It's not like I have anything else to do, right? She threw on whatever clothes she grabbed first. I had a normal job. I understand numbers. Now I'm following instructions that appear in the night. Why not? She wasn't usually one to talk to herself, but the silence in her lovely, weird little cottage was unnerving. Thankfully, Black didn't respond. She grabbed her keys, checked the back door, and left. Brenda was waiting at the reception desk and smiled widely when she came out of the elevator. Looks like you're in a hurry. I've got your morning paper here and some mail that's been forwarded from your old place. Want me to take it upstairs? Maggie stopped and took a second to steady herself. Can you go upstairs? I thought it was all cloak and dagger. Brenda rolled her eyes. Haven't you read the book yet, silly? Of course I can. I'll let you go wherever you are going. Anything you need from me? Sanity. Answers. Somehow, she knew she wouldn't get any useful information, at least not yet. Could you find out which delivery places are best in this area? I don't cook, and I may starve to death if I have to eat too many microwave meals. She stopped and stared at Brenda. How do you know about the book? Brenda laughed. Sure thing. Want me to choose a takeout for you tonight and get it delivered at a certain time? And as for the book, I know all kinds of fun stuff. You'll see. She shrugged and grinned. Um, no, thanks. I don't know when I'll be back or what I'll feel like having. Maggie had never had an assistant of any kind, nor had she really had anyone to take care of things even when she was young. It felt just as surreal as the rest of her life had become. No problem. Good luck. Maggie headed in the spring morning, contemplating Brenda's words. Good luck. 
Why would she think I'd need luck? Did she leave me the note in the book? Given that Brenda could go up to the cottage and apparently knew about the book, it seemed possible. But why would she? Did she go by Seamus after 4.46 p.m.? She considered going back to ask, but she had a feeling any answer she got would be about as helpful as gum in your hair. Instead, Maggie entered the address from the note into her phone's GPS and headed down to the subway to catch the 6 to City Hall. It was in a part of town she'd never bothered to go. Money bled from the walls of the buildings, and the people smelled of jaded success. The area made her feel like she was dragging her roots along behind her for everyone to see. Question for you, Bray. How do you decide what's believable and what isn't? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I think it's a fine line between specific believability and, and kind of the strangeness of it. And I think that's why I like urban fantasy, because you get to play in the world that's already here and just expand on it and make it more interesting. So I think I go back, particularly in fairy tales, I go back to what we have been taught in fairy tales, that these things exist, that the fairies are out there, that, that they're trolls and gremlins and things that mess with your socks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I tread the line of things we've been taught and I filter them into, into my writing as part of kind of the subconscious thing that we're brought up with. Mm. Right. Jane, Leslie, what do you, how do you decide when you're creating your works what's believable and what is a stretch too far for you? Do you bring us whole, pull yourself back? <laughs> and now we know how to get up on it. Is that a message? <laughs> what you write has to be, it has to obey its own internal logic. Um, it quite guess it comes down to readers. And I know some people who don't read science fiction won't read fantasy because they're not willing to make that effort or they cannot make, make themselves believe it. Some readers, I think, find it easier than others. I've probably got my own limits. The one that I think does upset me, though, is where books don't obey. If I'm reading somebody else's work and it just doesn't obey its own logic or they're just things that I think, you know, it's... Well, that's the example I think I may have given yesterday somewhere um, was, you know, where you've got something in a desert and look at these huge monsters, and you think, well, what do they eat when the travellers aren't around? You know, there has to be, you can't leave questions like that. But as long as you can answer it, and it all hangs together. Some readers will go with you, some won't. How to make it believable. Yeah. Uh, Raging at the Stars is a, pretty much a conspiracy storybook, and not everybody believes in them. So I wanted to make sure that everything that's in that book you can go and research and there is a plausible idea of behind it. The fun thing about it is playing with those things. Do you believe in flying saucers? Do you believe in aliens? If you don't, what would you do if you were actually confronted by one? And that's where the, that's where the fun is. So it's the what, what if yeah. is what you ask yourself to get to create what yeah. you're trying to create. I wanted, my lead character is somebody that looks into conspiracy theories, but the thing that she doesn't believe in is aliens. Mm -hmm. And that's what she has to face. Are they there? Are they real? And what she would do if faced by one. Mm -hmm. So next up, to give us a bit of uh, their writing, is Jane Fletcher who is practically a member of the Federation of Master World Builders. <laughs> She's a GCLS award-winning writer and has also been shortlisted for the Galactic Spectrum and the Lambda Literary Awards. She's a recipient of the Alice B. Readers Appreciation Awards Medal. Her work includes two ongoing sets of fantasy romance novels. Is it Selena? Is that even that's it? The Selena series and the Liarmouth Chronicles as well as written three standalone novels, Wolfbane, Wolfsbane Winter, The Shoestone and The Isle of Broken Years. Her love of fantasy began at the age of seven when she encountered Greek mythology. 
This was compounded by a childhood spent clambering over every example of ancient masonry she could find. There's a theme going here. <laughs> Medieval castles, megalithic monuments, Roman villas. Her resolute ambition was to become an archaeologist when she grew up. So it was something of a surprise when she became a software engineer instead. That's a money though. Born in Greenwich, London in 1956, she now lives with her wife in southwest England, where she's surrounded by enough historic monuments to keep her happy. Jane's reading from the Empress and the Acolyte. Okay. If, um, can you hear me at the back? Or, yes, okay, if you, do, just, if you can't, just gesticulate and I'll use the mic. Okay, um, in the brief for this, it was um, how do you describe things you've got no experience of? And this is it's from an old book, but it was about as far from anything that we've actually experienced. I was trying to work into the story, as you'll see from the reading. Um, my heroes in the, the Larmouth books are Tevi, who's a warrior, and Jamerel, who's a sorcerer. And um, they've been separated for a while, and while they're apart, Tevi has a very confusing encounter with a dragon. And so after they meet up again, they're talking about it. And so. Tevi finished telling the story. So what game do you think Shard was playing? A half smile crossed Jamerel's face. There's a saying among sorcerers, Never try to second-guess a dragon. <laughs> Teddy laughed. You certainly don't want to take chances with them. Shard could have destroyed the town. But there's more to it. Dragons don't experience time the same way we do. For them, time exists in two dimensions. Don't sorcerers do the same thing? Teddy asked. A bit, but not without going mad if they had the gift too strongly. Our minds can't deal with it. And dragons can. Jamerel nodded. Does that mean dragons can predict the future? Sort of, but they don't see it like that. Jamerel paused. The best analogy I can give is that humans see their lives like a book, with one page following the next. It's one-dimensional and linear. Dragons view their lives like a painting, in two dimensions. A dragon always knows everything it's ever going to know, but there's no point asking it about anything else. They're aware of their entire life simultaneously, except simultaneous as a concept that doesn't make sense from their viewpoint. Tevi pursed her lips, frowning. What are you thinking, Jamerel asked. I'm trying to work out if Shard would have made any more sense if I'd taken the conversation backwards. The first genuine laugh of the day burst from Jamerel. It, it doesn't work like that. But you're now a member of an exclusive group who've spoken with a dragon and lived to tell of it. Have you? Jamerel shook her head. Oh, no, I've never even seen one. <laughs> well, Shard was impressive to look at, but you haven't missed much in the talking. Even when Shard did make sense, it could be... Evil isn't the right word. It felt much less focused. Amoral, Jamerel suggested. Yeah, that's it. I was taught a dragon's time sense is incompatible with our ideas of good and evil. We think a bad act is one that has bad consequences. But for a dragon, effect doesn't follow cause. Everything is part of a fixed pattern. When humans kill, they see it as ending a life. When a dragon kills, for them, nothing has changed. In two-dimensional time, the victim is still a living, not yet born and already dead. Tevi looked thoughtful. It was her time to die. Pardon? That was the reason Shard gave for killing someone. So Jane, you create whole world. Do you use, do you create maps? Um, sometimes, yes. I mean, I've usually got a vague map just to make sure that the geography is going to make sense, that it's going to be plausible and said and follow its own logic. That if I've got cities a certain distance apart, they're, they're, they're not shifting mm -hmm. between the start and the end of the book. You know, if there's a mountain range in between it, they can't walk between. So I've just got to make sure that it will make sense. It's got that degree of plausibility to it. Do you freehand draw or do you use a software? I freehand draw. Mm -hmm. Have you got any with you? Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I'm trying to think. Are they printed in any of your books? That most of my books will actually will have a map at the beginning, but I've got a feeling that the three books at the back are uh, one of the rare examples of books that mine that don't have maps in. Well, anybody that's interested, have a look in the front of Jane's mm -hmm. books that are up there and see. Yeah. Oh, they haven't got any. They, those ones haven't, no. It's about the only three books I've ever done that don't.
if you're, if you're writing fantasy but there's an accepted genre in place already, like vampire, demons, fairy, fairies, but there's lots of cultural references. How do you decide how much of the ex established genre to include? Where, where do you decide to go against it? And what's that play? How does that play work out for you guys? I don't know how much this... this you're both, why are you watching both of them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Brian, there's a particular, you know. Well, actually, even with me, I mean, like, with dragons, there, there's accepted you know, ideas about what dragons are. I mean, we're saying, well, dragons actually see time in two dimensions. But it gave me, like, you know, it felt like a, a burst of inspiration because it gives me so much about, dra you know, dragons. They're supposed to be amoral. They love gold. Well, I say, well, they like gold because it doesn't change. It's one of the immutable things in their life. And some of the stuff that is common belief about dragons just came from saying, well, they see time in two dimensions, which worked for other things in the book. Um, it's one thing, though, you don't get female dwarves. It's... You know, um, Terry Pratchett deals with it quite humorously. Um, um, Tolkien kind of glossed it over largely. I, I, in my books, dwarves are hermaphrodites that I just throw in. Um, you, if you know, I've read so much mythology. I know what the rules are. I know what's, I know where the wiggle room is. That I can take my own slant on things. I think that's the answer. Is you know where the wiggle room is, and you play with it. I love genre convention because I love knowing kind of how to write what I want to write and then play with it and see what comes out. Um, fairy tales. I start with a concept, usually. I don't start with character, I start with plot. So I think, um, for, for Spinning Tales, for instance, I simply saw an ad for a fairy tale cottage that was for sale on top of a New York apartment building. It was $3 million. But it's this gorgeous little cottage on top of this horrible brick apartment building. Like, who put it there? <laughs> who thought, ooh, this is a good idea, and built a cottage on top of it? So I started there. And because I know my genre, and I know fantasy, and I love fantasy, I thought, okay, let's see where that goes. Let's open the door and, and go from there. So I think for me, it's like Jane said, it's that wiggle room. And, and asking why. But why does that happen? Conspiracy theories, why? Why do they believe that? What do they want to know? And, and then playing within the, the genre itself. With um, the Angels and Demons book, I love one of the re reviews that I got where they said um, she has very controversial um, views on religion. Um, so my wriggle room was I was writing what I damn well wanted. Um, <laughs> I, had, I had my angels. I had somebody... Um, me up on the fact that um, it was a male angel, and, and, it, and they gave me this huge long email, um, did you do this because of this, or this because of this, this because of this, and was he this, 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 and I read it and I just wrote back and I went, I wanted a male angel. <laughs> <laughs> in a white suit, I wanted that, that basic look because that's what fit. With the conspiracy theories, um, oh, you can have so much fun with that. Um, and finding people who've read it that have come up and go, yeah, I actually believe that, but I don't believe this. And it's like, let me show you. <laughs> there's, always, there's always something you can change. You can wriggle a lot. She may look like angel cake wouldn't melt in her mouth, but Leslie Davis has a diabolical mind. <laughs> Leslie hails from the West Midlands. She's a die-hard sci-fi fantasy fan and a passionate gamer. Her book, Dark Wings Descending, was a Lambda finalist. Leslie writes in all genre, but the heart of her story is always the romance. Just a big softy, aren't you? Yes. Leslie is reading from Raging at the Stars. <coughs> In the night sky, there appeared to be a fleet of triangular aircraft from the size of them. Oh, sorry, before I start, this is Emery. <laughs> it would help if I explain. I know it, so I know where she is. Emery is the one that you're with. She's at Area 51, where she's not supposed to be at, um, because they do cordon you off 
a long way away, but she has a view over. Um, and she's there for just, just checking, just in case there are anything going on. Um, she also has a person in her ear, which is Dink. And Dink is her eyes on what's happening around the world. And she's just relaying to him what she's seeing. They are looking for military aircraft. And that's not what they find. In the night sky, there appeared to be a fleet of triangular aircraft. From the size of them, she calculated there were at least three lengths of a football field each. A multicoloured light was situated at each of the three points of the ship's shape. They flashed out a rhythmic pulse that was almost hypnotic. The lone light in the centre was a pure white beam. It was obviously those beams that had flooded the area with light. Only one remained now, directed toward the ground. Emery tried to count how many ships she could see. She was getting two, maybe three, hidden in the darkness. The first explosion hit and blew Emery flat on her back. Debris flew wildly into the air, and it was only when the dust settled that Emery could see that a large crater had been left in the middle of the airbase. Holy shit! She watched with a dawning horror as small, saucer-shaped objects flew out from the belly of the bigger ships. They just appeared as if they'd been cloaked from view. All of them took aim on the vast area below. Whatever weaponry they were equipped with cut through the ground with ease and laid waste to any buildings in the way. Within seconds, the area was obliterated, all the buildings erased, and the ground was nothing more than a mass of huge craters. You're not safe there. Thank you, Captain Obvious, Emery muttered. I can't exactly start my engine while they're bombing the bejesus out to the base below. Something caught her eye and she saw a thin light appear out of nowhere, deep from within one of the craters. Emery watched as people started scrambling over the crater's edge. I can see people evacuating. They're coming directly out of the crater, so there has to be something down there. Emery could do little more than watch, as the saucers emitted a thin beam of light directly into the people's path. They stood paralysed by it until one by one they started to rise off the ground. They were suspended in the air as if held on strings wielded by a master puppeteer. Then, without warning, they were sucked up into the saucer and the light extinguished. I don't think that's the military, Emery. Dink's voice was unusually quiet in Emery's ear. But I don't believe in this, Emery whispered, watching as the saucers shot up into the air at an alarming speed. It disappeared as quickly as it appeared. Here, then gone. Just like the people it had taken aboard. I don't think you have a choice. It's too late, Emery. They're here. So, oh, maybe some questions from the audience about fantasy, sci-fi, world building. Okay, so when dealing with established creatures, uh, werewolves, vampires, demons, trolls, whatever, um, are there conventions that you acknowledge and go, yeah, that's a thing, and then go, no, I'm not doing that? Is there anything that you just say, I'm going to do this completely differently and hope nobody lynches me when it's done? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, possibly not. I mean, in terms of, um, I mean, I say like with dragons, but everybody knows about dragons, that they, they fly, they breathe fire, they're lizard-like. And uh, if I want to make it, um, you know, earthbound, hairy thing with teeth, you know, it's not a dragon anymore, it's a polar bear or whatever. <laughs> so there's only so far you can actually go from the convention. And, but, um, if the animal doesn't do what you want, then make up a new one. It's nice to go with the wiggle room, like, you know, take the animal that everybody knows and make it your own by saying, actually, no, people know this, this, and this, but this is because of that, and so and so, and you swap it around. That is the fun. And if it doesn't do that, and you have to break the conventions too much, just forget it, create a new monster. Yeah, I think so. I mean, like, like Jane, mythology is my first love. And when you're working with something that's so well established, it's kind of hard to break that and to make it new because it's already out there. Uh, but like with the Furies, th throughout history, they change quite a lot. And you end up with their kind of evil hacks with snakes in their hair and then their bringers of light and peace. So they, they change drastically through the centuries. But there's only ever three of them. But there's only ever three. And, um, and they each have a role. 
So I was able to take all three of them and their role, but then decide what I want them to be now because they do change. So that made it easier to do. Um, in Spinning Tales, some of the fairy tale creatures, I had to think about that. And, and do I want them to be kind of your traditional little fairy? Or, um, but no, I'm bite and they're alcoholics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I wanted to change it. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've changed the most with, um, with the angels and demons from the, the Wing series. Everybody has their own view of what an angel looks like and what a demon's going to be. And I wanted to play with that to have it that, yes, this is what you think it is, but they're just that little bit different. Um, I have the, the demons can walk on the earth, but they don't, they don't look like demons unless you have a power, then you can see them. And it was fun to play with that, that suddenly you've got the main character who can see these things that she's never seen before. So that, that was kind of fun. I would say, well, if you want to break the rules, you should know what the rules are you're breaking. You need to know your genre. You need to know what you're breaking and why. I think that's true, particularly the why. I think if you've got a good reason, I, in, uh, in my vampire novels, go at first. My vampires don't kill. They drink blood, but they don't drain humans of blood to, to their death. And my logic for that was that if vampires existed, if vampires exist and they drain humans of blood the whole time, then they will be discovered pretty quickly. But if they drink blood, but the human goes on living and has no memory or knowledge that that's happened, then that I could convincingly create a, a world of vampires who exist in our world. So it, it's sort of. I've mm. got to write the second book to that. <laughs> I've been in ten can years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when creating sort of a brand new character, creature, sort of thing that doesn't exist in our world, um, do you kind of have an image in your mind of what you want them to look like to start with? Do you kind of have an idea of what you want them to be able to do? Or do you kind of have um, an idea of where you want them to be in the story? How do you kind of begin with that completely new creature? Uh, yeah, because yeah, I had to do that for the first time in, in the one that comes out in November. And I needed an animal that killed people. My stuff sounds wow. really dark. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds really dark. I, I don't write dark stuff. I write fluffy stuff, I swear. Um, <laughs> but I needed an animal that would kill people. And that's kind of where I started. I need something that is really horrible and menacing. So I started with that premise. And then I thought, so it comes out at night. And they mate at a certain time of year. And that's why these people have to escape this area. So I started with the concept and then built it from there as to what I needed to do. Yeah, and you don't basically sort of think, I'm going to create this animal and then I'm going to maybe use it somehow in the story. Basically you are creating for a plot point. You wanted to kill, you wanted to carry somebody, you wanted to jump out of somewhere and scare somebody. Is there going to be a plot reason for what it's, it's going to do something in the plot. That's why you're creating it. You know, if you don't need it for the plot, then say yourself that has them, don't create it. Um, and so actually know what it needs to do. That is what determines the characteristics you're going to give it. You know, if he's going to, if he's going to kill, how you know, you may want to think how he wants to kill. He's going to bite, claw, shred. Yeah, hit it with a solid <laughs> iron bomb. You, you know, you know what the <laughs> plot needs, and that's what you're going to play. That's how you're going to craft it to fit into your story to fulfil the plot requirements. It's not a fluffy Pikachu. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It really is. It's happy. Yeah. <laughs> So if you can guess it, yours is not a sort of candy floss for no, the bubbles. It is. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I'm sad to I mean, I mean, where do you create your people from? Like your wings? How do you? Uh, where do you create them from? My imagination. Why? Because that's where they. That's where they live. I feel like this reader that got this. I wanted a male angel. <laughs> <laughs> They're in my head. I work out an idea. You know, I want to write a detective story. Or with this one, um, I want a conspiracy theorist, and they start forming themselves 
pretty much straight away. What they see is you have to have it based in something that people can recognise. If I'm saying um, my flying pig, you know what a pig looks like, you know what wings look like. There's no point me saying, um, trying to describe it as something that we've never seen because even way back when with the cave drawings they drew things that we can recognise now. Or if you go the conspiracy route, they have um, shapes that are classed as flying saucers, but they drew them as fiery dragons. So they're not saying that they were fiery dragons, but what they saw was a shape that could fly and it breathed fire. Mm. But you know what it is. When you look, you can see that it's something that flew and breathed fire. You can take it that it's a dragon, or you can take it that it's a flying saucer. So if you've learned nothing else today, you know that dragons live in two-dimensional times, <laughs> and they are also flying saucers. 